What's going on, y'all? Today's guest is Eva Alexio Rio. She's the founder and CEO of Feta Booking Agency, a talent agency and an artist management company, which she has run since 1996. She's also a member of NITO, N-I-T-O, the National Independent Talent Organization, where they're currently fighting for independent talent agencies, independent independent music uh, management companies, right? Where they're fighting for their their workers and the artists that they represent and trying to save the live music industry. Ever since COVID hit, the live music industry has been dying. Venues are disappearing. Small companies are going out of business. People are doing different things. Like great people are leaving the music industry because there, there is no touring industry at least, right? So Eva is helping with Nito, helping fight for that cause. She's also a professor at Northern Vermont University. Before that, she has taught at Drexel University. So she's taught music business for at least eight years already. Uh, she's an amazing guest. It was a really fun conversation. We talk about how you can get involved with Nito and help fight for the Restart Act, the Save Our Stages Act, and which we don't talk about this in conversation because this was recorded a while ago. We also talk about the Hits Act. Uh, so many, many ways you can help save the music industry. In this conversation, we also talk about her journey in the music business, starting Feta Booking Agency, being a teacher in, in music business, and much, much more. This was a really fun conversation. So thank you all so much for watching. Please take a quick second to subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment. We'd love to engage you guys in the comments, answer any questions that you have about this episode. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with the amazing Eva Alexio Rio. Live the life you love. So I noticed you're also a college professor. Um, mm-hmm. Started out as an adjunct, which, which am I right now. Um, what do you teach? Like, tell me about your, your teaching and where you teach. So in the past 10 years, I've taught the touring and concert promotion classes, management classes, booking labs, where we are able to apply um, a lot of the lessons that were taught into real life scenarios. And of course I make them speak to all the people like people at AG and, you know, really get them, get them in the, the awkward situations where they have to break through those boundaries. Um, recently I taught a recently in first time ever, um, a, a modern issue uh, in the music industry class, which mm-hmm. I was, uh, asked to teach and it was a learning curve for me and um I, in, in terms of the subject not not mm-hmm. yeah teaching. sounds um, interesting yeah and it was the first time i taught online on the college level too which so i had a, which you know is funny because now we're all online yeah. um but um yeah so that was really interesting because i had to do a lot of research and not just give, give opinion based issues. I need to really see what was, you know, um, was an issue that is coming up frequently uh, between, um, you know, stats and, and finding out um, barriers that are being built that are, are not allowing artists or industry people to move forward successfully. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was a lot of information that I was also finding out for the first time. So yeah. I was kind of learning with the class and I thought it was cool that I was asked to do it and I was really flattered. Um, yeah, so I like, I like teaching, it breaks up. It always breaks things up for me because I've been yeah. in for 23 years. So it breaks mm-hmm. up that, you know, the whole agenting industry world and then I'm dealing with students that um, sometimes teach me things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I learn a lot from my students all the time. Yeah, totally. What, what's one thing that you learned like for preparing for that of course that you feel like maybe a lot of people in the music industry or new to music industry don't know about? Um, I think the biggest thing I, I was able to look at numbers, like really like use, you know, analytical breakdowns um, was the disconnect between Spotify, Instagram, and actual concert goers, active fans that are on social and Spotify versus inactive. Um, what m- multiple million um, ongoing streams of songs versus monthly listeners mm-hmm. on Spotify. And even though some of that seems like common sense, um, I didn't realize how big the gap was, the disconnect. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't realize that you really could have someone streaming 
um, you know, millions upon millions of songs and they couldn't even draw a hundred kids. It was, yeah. it was really um, eye awakening research that I did. And it really made me feel like, you know, dating myself a little bit here, but going back to the sound scan days and looking at someone's sound scan be like, well, in Travis city, Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, there's like, 40,000 people listening to the single, but you're drawing maybe 1% of that, you know? And, right. and I remember in, back in the radio South scan days where we would have to look at that and be like, okay, well, where is the band scanning a lot of numbers and then take 10% of that or, you know, like, and then, and then apply it and then apply it to where right. you're really going to play. And I was like, wow, that still exists in Spotify. But I find it interesting because there is like a, I feel like even a bigger disconnect because I wouldn't take 10% of an artist's um, monthly listeners. I would actually take like 1%. Yeah. And, it, and and I think I'm being generous because- I think that's generous like, too. I yeah. did the math for someone the other day. Someone said that, I was a student and he said, someone that owns a venue told him that you could take, I guess 5% of their total social media followers. Mm -hmm. And that's about how many tickets would sell. And I was like, no way. That's overly ambitious. Cause that's super generous. Yeah. yeah. Cause it means if you have a million followers, that's 50,000, you can, you can go play in the stadium. I think like, also there's a, the whole element of like, um, social figures, you know, like people, I mean, people will follow me on my Instagram and on un maybe unfollow me. I don't know. Unfollow me, or, you know, like all the time where I'm like, I don't even know why this person would be following me. Like, I'll look yeah. at like, why? <laughs> you know, like, and there's, there's the whole social figure in terms of, Oh, Hmm. They posted this one thing once mm -hmm. and the hashtag popped up or someone mentioned their name and they go to it. And then a month later they go, why did I start following that person? I don't remember right. why I didn't start following the person unfollow. I do that all the time. I'm like, right, yeah. I start following, and sometimes I follow it like a, like a, like oh, I have to remember to check out what this person's doing, and then mm -hmm. a month later, you know, it, I'm like, oh, it's not like I can go, you know, YouTube's like the information, you know what I right. mean? Like, like I'll search a name, like I have no idea why I I'm following this person, <laughs> but I, I do think you know I have some artists which are really. Um, empowering, sorry, there's like a random noise. Um, empowering people that are musical artists. Um, and sometimes I feel like that blurs their live performance element too, you know, or, or I think that sometimes people will um, be more into the culture mm -hmm. of whatever genre that is, but not an active show goer. So it's really a lot of, you know, a lot to go into those numbers. You might hear my seven-year-old asking about what that noise is. Okay. That's okay. You might you might hear a baby crying. <laughs> <Right back there. laughs> yeah. I, I'm all about kids being around, so you know. <laughs> That's awesome, and, um, and it probably varies a lot by genre too. Like certain genres, the it's probably a higher fraction of percentage of the streams of people who buy yeah. tickets, and then for certain genres, it's probably lower because it's more totally. of a Spotify crowd. Yeah, I mean, someone was saying how um, like Under Oath just did that those three days streaming event and it was extremely successful. I mean, like mm -hmm. growing and growing, it's still growing from what my understanding is. And they have le less monthly listeners than um, some of the artists that are out there right now that draw a hundred people yet, you know, mm -hmm. they, 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 they've grown something like over $700,000 on those streams so far. <laughs> you know yeah, what I wow. mean? Like, That's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 you're right. It's genre. It's, it's, it's uh, maybe age demographic too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also how well, yeah, frequencies. So also like how well you've established your, your business, right? If you had one song that's got millions of views or mm -hmm. streams, but the other songs don't, then that's telling a lot too. Um, maybe people are just into that one song, but not into the whole brand of songs right. or the business of the artist. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not like, back when we were kids and new kids on the block released a, a one <laughs> a one song and then and then the, the album later and you knew very well that you would have to buy the whole album to yeah. listen to that one song and you have to go to the concert to listen to wait for that one song yep. it's all on spotify it's all there now you know it's all there. <laughs>
So it takes away from that element of excitement a little bit too. And then you leave, you have the playlist. So you'll see an artist, their, their one song will keep growing, which is great. But if it's not, if it's not transferring over to the other songs or the monthly listeners, then right. it's not so great. You're saying, exactly. well, th that song is connecting, but, the, but people who are listening to it are not coming from across the room to find out who is performing, who's playing that song from that exactly. playlist, right. you know? Playing in the background on the playlist. Right, 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 right. And I, I'm guilty of that too. Like I always play through something through. And, and if I don't make it there on time to find out who it is, or I'm like, wow. I mean, this is probably bad, but I have a playlist I listen to pretty much almost every day while I'm working. It's like my like, playlist is just like really focused too and uh -huh. kind of just zone out and be lost in the work. Yeah. But, I probably can't name you a single artist that's no, on the playlist. That's, that's, and that's terrible. I know my Apple, my Apple playlist, which is the one I run to. Mm -hmm. um, I have I I maybe know three artists on it, but but it has like a good tempo, so it makes me actually want to finish my run. Yeah, and we're and we're in the industry, right? So we, if we're not even like looking into every like artist or a certain percentage, like imagine the people that aren't in the industry. It's, well, unfortunately, the music industry is guilty of waiting for something to be ready for them. Um, I feel like that's always been a thing. Um, and except you have like the one passionate um, industry person that's like, no, I'm, I'm, I don't care. Like, I love this. I'm taking it on early. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there's like two artists which are fantastic artists. I was just talking to a, a friend um, at a publishing company and She's like, you know, these are, they're so, so great. They're just a little on the early stage for us. And I'm always like, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? <laughs> like, do you want to find an artist early? Like my whole thing is I was like, I found them first. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. What kind of, what kind of content do you use for like for teaching? Cause you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there. These, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there, but there's also all kinds of gaps that I always feel are hard to fill when, when teaching. Like if I want a piece of content for, like a specific lesson I'm teaching and it's just not there. It's like, okay, the only resource is my experience that I'm teaching. Um, sure. I guess what do, what do you use between books, podcasts, or YouTube videos? Um, um, I mean, I basically use, I find, I like to find things that have quarterly numbers. Okay. Use, um, you know, when I was busier teaching, which I'm not, busy teaching right now. I'm busy industrying right now, but not busy teaching. Um, when I was really, really busy teaching, I would pull um, quarterly numbers, statistics from Polestar. I would depend okay. on Polestar's numbers. Um, and though I find Polestar the most accurate, it, it does hurt currently. Um, because numbers are not turned in as frequently right. as they were once in the past. Um, but right. for the eight years I was consistent at Drexel, those numbers, and I was at Drexel consistently for eight years, and then I started swaying away from teaching um, as often. I used their, their, their quarterly reports and they were really spot on because mm -hmm. um, the venues were registering all the numbers often. Now, uh, a lot of venues will tell, I'm, I'm finding are not registering the numbers as often as they once did. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if there has been a service change. Like, I don't know if there was a, a, you know, a fee that got tacked on or, you know, right. like, but I liked pulling my numbers from there because there would be like the hundred grossing artists and the hundred grossing uh, sheds, arenas, clubs, mm -hmm you know, top hundred promoters. And I found it really, um, and I found like a really good insight. I especially like showing my students the gap between like Fleetwood Mac's anniversary mm -hmm. tour and like, you know, like, um, I don't know, Melanie Martinez. I'd be like, so you could still see that, you know, the reason why we're having a good year is because we have all these reunion tours of like right. journeys back out again. Right. Doesn't necessarily mean everyone's doing amazing. Right. You're just you're just talking about, you know, that top three percent and then you could it was really nice to be able to show that. That mm -hmm. and then I would always present things to my students like, so are we actually up? <laughs> are we are yeah. you know, like so then you, you get to the point where you're like, in theory, 
we're not, but by numbers we are, you know what right. I mean? So it was always mm -hmm. like a nice conversation to be able to have your students look at these numbers. I use a lot of paper back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still feel good um, but to have the information to be able to apply it and, and digest it and then come up with your own, um, you know, report like, yes, the numbers are up by the dollars and the, the capacity and the gross. But if you didn't have these bigger, like the kids bop and, mm. you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me now, but fill in the blank, then right. maybe those numbers wouldn't actually look as great as, as they are, as they yeah. are. That's cool. Yeah. That's a cool exercise. I might yeah. steal that one from you. No, you do it. <laughs> yes. If you ever need those reports, I'll tell you where to get them from. So, so a thing I use a lot for, I just, I'm teaching an artist management class. And what I was telling you about before we hit record, I do a weekly artist manager spotlight where they do listen to like a podcast of an interview of a manager. Mm -hmm. And what I really try to like work really hard this semester is because I had a, a guest on the podcast. She has a, a youth center for at-risk youth. And she has a, you know, a doctor degree, she's a therapist. And she's just talking about how she's been, like she's a black woman that's been taught by white professors with white textbooks and everything all her career. Mm -hmm. And she feels like she's like kind of teaching her kids like a biased perspective. It's like a realization that she comes to me. a biased perspective, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So like I'm like working hard to find interviews from managers that are black, managers that are women, man that's managers awesome. that are, right. yeah. So it's like super diverse. So that was uh, a first challenge, but then two, like, they can see like all different kinds of management styles. Cause I feel like the best way to learn is just listen to management managers talk and they'll hear, hear the lingo they hear yeah. them talking about tours and all that. So that's kind of an exercise I, I use a weekly spotlight and you have to write a discussion board on that. I love that. I mean, I think that, um, there's, there's a need for that to, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're bringing that those diversities into your classroom, but also to know that, um, I find it interesting that, uh, that doctor um, communicated feeling that she's teaching a bias view because all of her educators were white and she's not. And that's, yeah. that's actually something we talk about in our household quite a bit because we are, you know, a very active anti-racist house and we're, we're putting, you know, a lot of effort into a lot of different things <laughs> as mm -hmm. when it comes to um, being the 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 best uh you know anti-racist individuals we could be you know yeah. um and uh i find that really um insightful and awesome that uh that's something that she is bringing up to you yeah and it's, it's helped me a lot i mean it's helping me change yeah. the way i teach now it's almost like it's i don't know how deep i want to go into this rabbit hole but it's, it's almost like you have to do things like consciously like you can't just say yeah. oh i'm not racist and just keep going about your day how you are every exactly. day because if you're only having I don't know, if i only have white guests on my podcast like that's and like white males that's not good like no. even though i don't feel like i'm racist that's could come across that's that not way. being so anti-racist either right you're not doing anything right. to change yeah, so it takes a conscious it's also, yeah it, it does it takes a very conscious effort and it's you have to be super proactive in it and um you know i have an artist, Trans Violet, and we um, we were actively trying to find for our 2021 tour um, a, a an artist of color to, mm -hmm. to come. And it's funny because doing like diving into that, we're like, God, so, there's like such little options. And yeah. it's funny because I had another client um, who wanted, and this is be for coronavirus conversations, we really want to take out a female artist. And again, I was going through it. I'm like, how is it that we don't have any, like, like not enough options yeah. for female artists? And so, you know, it's like, and I had this conversation with um, a friend of mine and she was, I had explained to her, she said, well, you know, is it, do, you, do you find it fair when someone um, initiates a conversation with we are looking for specifically a female artist or specifically an artist of color and I said well it is if they're trying to even the playing field so mm -hmm. yes yeah, like it's kind of like saying we're looking for a ska band <coughs> <laughs> but it's like someone saying like it's it's not it's 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 being specific 
because that's specifically what they want. So, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if it's not to take away from all the males that are working hard, but there's, you know, for the women artists, we need the allies in men right. to take out and, and help uh, those support slots also be filled by female yeah. artists. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, and for, you know, like artists of color, it's the same thing. Like you need to, to everyone needs to be doing their part to be um, more, you know, proactive. Yeah, yeah. mindful and proactive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you started your agency, Fata Booking, uh, in 96. Were, yes. you still in, were you still in college when you, when you started the company? I just started college. Yeah. Okay. So I started Fata... February 96, I, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, um, and I was 18, um, and I worked at the radio station at college, and I met bands that way, mm -hmm. and I did shows in Wilkes-Barre when I was younger, like before I was in college, and so, you know, it was a small scene, like any right. band that came through, like they hung out after everyone mm -hmm. got to know, you know, so I became friends with Hot Water Music, and then in college, I was helping them. Um, a little bit. And then uh, Jason Black from Hot Water Music initiated um, the question where he was like, hey, you know, I want to help, you know, like book some shows, we get, you know, yeah. all do this part and you could do this part. <laughs> Eventually I started doing all the parts. And, um, and then they, they were a band. I mean, at the time this was during Fuel for the Hate Game and Gainesville Pride and mm -hmm. lots of love for Gainesville. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned so much about Florida back then. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I never knew there was a thing called boiled peanuts or sweet tea prior to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to get my phone charger, excuse me. I mean, my computer charger while I'm talking to you. I apologize. Um, okay. And then when we were, you know, working together, um, I met a band called Elliot through them. Mm -hmm. And then I started helping Elliot. Um, and then they started getting a lot of attention and Kevin Lyman of Warped Tour at the time was um, of course the owner of Warped Tour, but he also managed bands. Um, I think he had, I know he had the Ataris then. And I also think he had less than Jake at the time. Okay. And, and so, so he was, you know, back, back then, you know, managers really like called all the radio stations, college stations, and radio stations. They made the calls themselves. Um, right. So I would talk to him all the time. <laughs> it's like talking to Kevin all the time. <laughs> it's like this 18 year old kid at a college radio station. And I got warp Tour dates for Hot Water Music through him. And um, he's like, I remember Kevin's like, how old are you? And Kevin's still, we've been friends since I was 18. Um, I've worked with him on hundreds of bands and I've been, yeah. I, sh I, I got, I was on his bus for like three weeks, oh, cool. one summer, <laughs> like, and he still can't get my name right. He still calls me Eva. He calls me Eva Ava because he figures one of them is definitely right. <laughs> um, so, um, his wife once made fun of him. She's like, Kevin, it's Eva, you know? <laughs> and, um, he said, he's like, you know, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm like 18. And he's like, okay. He's like, do you know? what a contract is or so he he kind of walked me through all that stuff like what stage plot is and what an input oh, cool. list is and what a contract looks like and and then tim Bohr, who owns sound is one of the owners of sound talent agency and you know worked the agency group in uta and prior to that um he worked for a band called h2o and um i he would come with them sometimes to wilkesbury and we we got to meet in person because at the, at the time we were working together with hot water because hot water and h2o that was like kind of one same scene almost in some mm -hmm. respect hot water teetered like they they played in the like the afis and the that world too in like the bad religions and the social distortions but then you know people they were on you know they were on doghouse the so people that like the get up kids also liked Hot Water Music and people like right. the, the Promise Ring also liked Hot Water Music. So right. it was kind of a, a little bit, a bit of a bipolar back and forth there. But it was so, I knew people from different kind of elements in the music industry, which was cool, but I got to meet Tim and Tim was super helpful. Like right away with me, he's always 
giving me information on how to, you know, word different deals and what those look like. Mm -hmm. Cause I was young and back then we didn't have these college classes and there was a lot yeah. of falling on my face, like all the time. It was like every, every moment I got to fall on my face, I did. And then every moment I had to pick myself back up. <laughs> and, um, you know, Randy Nichols, uh, under Oath's manager. He was a booking agent back then, still, before he was There's a manager. some great mentors, though, that you have. Yeah. So it's There's like, it's, what'd you say? There's some really good mentors that you had there, though. Yeah, no, I feel super flattered. And you know what? I have to say, like, even them, outside of them, those are just, like, initial relationships. But later on in time, like, I mean, it, Feta grew fast because outside of that scene i worked for jimmy world and the clarity record and i was okay. 20 and i was still like i was young and i had to go to la a lot and um i had to like pretend to know what i was talking about <laughs> <laughs> um and um i mean i figured it out like anything i didn't know like i i did a good job of learning it but i mean you know it was really it, it was I don't know if I, intimidating is the right word because I had a lot of faith in myself. Mm -hmm. I might have been a little like, I can do anything kind of mindset, yeah. you know? You where, kind of were doing it already. But yeah. I definitely didn't want, like when someone told me I, like, I couldn't make it work, um, I really wanted to more, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so Feta got, I, I started meeting people in the, in the more like mainstream world because of Clarity. And I remember, um, you know, I had to learn a lot of things very quickly when I started working, even more, even more than with Hot Water and Jimmy World. I had to take it a, a, like a ricochet forward um, when I started working with people like Bridget Wright, who worked for Rage Against the Machine for 10 years, mm -hmm. and uh, Mark Geiger, who just, just currently stepped down from being the head of music at William Morris for, I can't even remember how long. I mean, he's there forever. He's yeah. like the king. Um, and it, I'm sure, like I, I'm sure Bridget probably was like, oh my God, I wanted to kill her when she was like 22, 23, 24. But like I, I them being so um, patient, not patient, just like, you know, insightful to, to, to guide me through things when I wasn't, when I could have been doing it better, really right. helped me step up my game. Mark mm -hmm. Geiger was always really supportive of me. Like Mark Geiger always was, was just super full of knowledge. And I remember when I got my first software, he was the one that was like helping me learn how to use it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I have, I feel very fortunate um, with everyone I've ever worked with, even, even the artists that, um i i work for and then i stopped working for like or mm. managers um that have had me that have had to make tough calls and we had several ways you know I, I feel very fortunate and grateful for all of those experiences yeah i always say promoting shows is like the ultimate gateway drug into the industry because you literally meet so many people from the artists the tour managers to agents to publicists to oh, yeah. everything yeah and, so yeah, that's how you started. Yeah, yeah. Now, now the goal is trying to figure out how to get started right now in these times. <laughs> yeah, well, I always tell people, you know, if you're not creating um, something in a platform of quietness, then, you know, you're not really doing anything to help yourself move forward. Exactly. And, yeah. Um, it's kind of like when I would tell my students, live at home with your parents as long as you can and start working for bands while you're in college. Yeah, so true. <laughs> so, yeah, what, what does the, the structure and the team look like for Feta? So we are typically a staff of three and one intern is usually on board. Um, before 2009, it was a staff of 10. Okay. Um, though when the economy crushed, crashed during that time, I made a conscious decision that I wanted to keep things smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I made a lot of tough calls back then, which a lot of people are making right now. Right. Um, and I didn't want to ever have to do that again. Mm -hmm. So we kept it um, very, you know, proactive as a unity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we try to help interns get positioned in good places afterwards too. 
Um, so right now it's um, Kalani and Chris, the office, which are um, fantastic. And both of them come from the touring side of the industry. They both, um, Kalani was a tour manager and Chris is an artist himself on tour. So they have a really good handle on how it feels to be out on the road, yeah. Yeah. you know? And I think experience. That, yeah, I think it's really important um, to have that experience at times, so. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we have a really good, we have a good posse here. They're very, they're very proactive. They always have really good, strong ideas. They're pleasant to be around, which for me, for me <laughs> matters. Yeah. I know that sounds silly, but for me, like, I'm just like such a, like an energy soaker. Like if people are cranky around me, I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> like now I feel cranky. You know what I mean? So I like, I like when people are in good spirits and I like when people are being proactive together and, um, I've always liked working in a team. Um, so that atmosphere is very, it's a very positive atmosphere. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, what do you look for in artists that you sign to your agency? Do, do you have any specific guidelines? So an example, um, you know, and I always look for that kind of stuff, especially when you're teaching, because you want to have like specific things, like set these things as goals. So, um, one of the past guests was Micah Davidson, who has a Blue Mountain artist. Um, cool. you know, Blue Mountain artist we used to work for. Oh, he's going to kill me. Midwood Entertainment is his uh, agency now. And he gave me some specific parameters uh, where they have to have at least a two year tour history. They have to be able to sell 300 tickets in their hometown, plus another 150 to 200 tickets in nine surrounding markets, uh -huh. and grows over $100,000 a year. But again, like, those are like, guidelines. It doesn't mean that every artist they that they sign that needs price. those. Yeah. Um, do you have anything like that? Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm like, a, I'm like, um, I'm just like a sucker for, for anything that pulls my, my music strings, you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of like when I see a cute puppy, I have to go over and pet it. Like if I hear something <laughs> I like, it doesn't matter how much I fight it, I'll, I'll want to work for it. So okay. um, I think that the conversation with Kalani and Chris are a little bit more structured than when I, mm -hmm. <laughs> than when I actually pick <laughs> someone up. Um, with Kalani and Chris, we, we do we do look at numbers, we took it, look at tour history, look at how long they've been an artist. Chris is like super on top. He's he's way more patient of an individual than I am. Like he'll watch an artist where I'm like, I like them too much. Do we need to work together right now? Yeah, do it right now. <laughs> so I mean that's just a lot of my personality where I'm just I I'm I get I'm when I get excited about things, I have to do it right now. And it's like my husband will confirm, like if I put something in my head. It's like, we're doing this now. There's no talking out of it. <laughs> yeah, but there's not much. So, um, yeah, Kalani and Chris, will. we, we as an office, we'll look at an artist together that we're all looking at and we'll weigh out the pros and cons. And, you know, there's, there's also a, a pretty drastic period where, you know, um, people didn't want to come to independence. You know, they, they were really more um, into the, uh, the name of the company versus the agent's history. So um, when we were watching things, we had to be honest with ourselves that first the artist might want to go to a bigger firm, which is always complicated because you don't want to, there's nothing worse than having to tell an artist like, well, I had those job offers, <laughs> you know, right. like this was a conscious decision, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, having to, to pitch yourselves. So um, that's one of the reasons like when I find something I really like, I probably jump on it early because I'm like, I want to sell myself and develop this artist and have, I always go into a relationship telling artists, you don't have to trust us out the gate. We'll earn that. We'll earn that trust right. fully mm -hmm. fine. And, but that's the process. We try, we try to make, look at Spotify numbers. We try to look at Instagram engagements not just the numbers that they're actually engaging, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they have a team that can help the process of uh, artist development on the road side of things, because there is a manager to manager, agent to agent relationship that needs to be kind of navigated. Right. Um, but for me, it's like, you know, like squeezing a teddy bear. If I find something I like, I'm like, oh, it's mine. <laughs> so um, that one of my artists, um, that I'm like super, I get super giddy about that I found him really early was Leona Bathins. And okay. I found, you know, it, it was a lot of work to, he's, doesn't, he's not even from the United States. So it's like, 
not only do I get giddy over someone that is an artist that needed a lot of work, um, but he lives in, he lives in Greece. Okay. So, huh. I mean, do you book we, tours in Europe for them? Um, no, I mean, I, I do book, I could book tours in Europe. We, we book MC Lars in Europe mm -hmm. and Alvarez Kings. Um, though with him, I, our goal was to tackle the United States. Like he's from Europe already. So um, we, we, there's a lot of hard work and we finally got things in motion here. And I, I credit a lot of that to the festival buyers that put them on festivals. Mm -hmm. um, early and that was I, I'm, I'm forever grateful for them finding him slots but also yeah. Alton Hageldorf at Spotify um, really gave some love to him early on when I when I came on board about, was about two years ago now and um, it really helped the process of being able to have a, a, a fluent conversation like this is a real artist you can be looking at please <laughs> you know <laughs> especially because Spotify wasn't a thing in Greece Right. Um, so like, you know, maybe the past year and a half, and then it was like a slow transaction because, um, a transition, excuse me, because they're a YouTube country, like okay. uh, they play like, you know, like tons of YouTubes where like you look at one of his YouTubes and be like 300,000 views on YouTube and then you go to Spotify and it's like nothing. <laughs> right. So yeah. that moving those communications slowly over is also things we work on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. So that's how my process is. Okay. So we're, we're running out of time pretty quick. So I want to uh, jump into Donito for a second. Uh, yes. Tell me about, you know, like the sort of national independence, independent talent organization. Tell me mm -hmm. about that. We so got Nito is, um, has been founded by um, the fantastic uh, agents like Stormy Shepard and Frank Riley and, uh, there's Nadia Mass and House, and um, there's, there's a collective of fantastic agents that came together um, to treat this kind of like a, a place for us to have a foundation to, to, to get assistance from, or to lobby to get assistance from the government and to be heard by the government and they're doing a fantastic job. I mean, I, I'm very proud to be involved. I'm a member, I'm one of the co-chairs for the booking committee, um, which we help to navigate available information for um, the members on drive-ins and live stream options and mm -hmm. who's opening what, where, when, and why, you know, things, mm -hmm. just options. Um, but um, it's also been a very active place for people on the members of board to reach out to people within their state in Congress and constantly sending um, letters to pay attention to the music industry people that are in need. And we're at a hundred percent loss and it's, it's, it's very important. And the companies that are part of NITO, they're included in the, the Save Our Stages Act? Um, yeah, and the Restart Act. So a lot of it is, it, it's, it's, I mean, NITO is obviously its own, its own, its own group, but right. we're all working together. I mean, like, obviously, like the NITO supports NIVA, and it, it's, it's all supposed to be intertwined. Um, but we are a, a membership organization that yeah. is structured to help save, the, you know, the music industry as managers, agents, crew. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, because yeah, I saw on the I, I went to the website, to the Nito website, and I saw it on the actual bill for for Save Our Stages. I was reading that before we started. Yeah, I saw it's for producers, promoters, town mm -hmm. town representatives, and live venues. So I was, I was assuming that you're that organizations, uh, companies within NITO probably fall with, under town representatives? Yes, right. So we're, you know, and if we're the town representatives, but we, th there's more than that in NITO. There was the talent agents, mm -hmm. there's the managers, um, you know, social media, opened up with publicists and social medias. And, you know, there's everyone that's independent. Mm -hmm. um, 
can be a part of NETO to be heard by Congress in Washington right now. Um, and of course, it's also, you said you went to the website. The website also has a really awesome resource page, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a part of like, you know, the, the different things. I don't know about you, but during this process, I found that in the beginning, it was very hard to find out what resource you have as a company, you know, mm -hmm. especially like a lot of us, what do we fall under, you know, I mean, we fall under being independently owned. So self-employment doesn't have a lot of benefits when it comes to, no. you know, maternity leave, for example, there's no benefits no. there or nothing, no. you know? <laughs> no. So um, I found it very hard in the beginning to navigate what information I needed as someone who is an independent company that's self-employed and you know what it means for employee if you have employees and how many and how much do you have to earn a year to be considered in this infrastructure so that resource page has like you know all of these different elements and variables that can help people mm -hmm. navigate what is actually eligible for them and there's like a lot of relief funds that are available out there and putting it in a place where your members can find it is super important yeah, absolutely. What can people do? So people that are music fans, people that are artists, um, people that are students or anybody, what can people do to help support uh, NITO and what you guys are doing in your efforts? Write your local Congress people. Tell them how important live music is. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the more Congress hears from people, the, the more likely they are to not just um, acknowledge that it exists and we're here, but to actually take a, a, a fierce consideration and, and, and put things in place to save the music industry. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, it's, it's funny how, um, how many people are affected in the music industry. I mean, like there's, there's crew and there's staging people and there's there's the sound engineers and there's the agents, the managers, the actual artists. Then there's the the staging. There's um, the van rental or bus rental or you know RV rental companies. It's so affected, mm -hmm. um, and it employs a lot of people. Right. I mean, there's people depend on the music industry to have a job. Yeah. Um, so. And they don't know anything else. Right, your Congress people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell them it's important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Cool. And I'll, I'll share that in the in the show notes for this episode as well, in a link cool. to where people can uh, find yeah, out. All the board founders are listed there. Um, it is a membership only um, organization, but um, I, for promoters, any promoters are listening. I'm uh, my email is. Uh, is attached, um, and I think Margie and Tim is, as well, to the website to inform us of any kind of a reopening, streaming, um, and we like to provide that to the members. So that way it gives people an opportunity to do things during this very unforeseen um, and unclear time. Yeah, and I'll definitely share that. Um, what, what are you, I guess, What's the, what is the word when shows might start back up, at least on a consistent basis or tours? Is it still kind of in limbo or what are the conversations like? I, I mean, as a non-scientist, non-doctor, um, <laughs> we have been putting things in the place on 2021. I, I can't speak for all agencies and agents because I know that some are... Um, are doing the same and others are concerned that's not realistic. It's really hard to know because we're five months into this and it's not clear that we would have been even here now. So like the, the fact that we are here is, is daunting in itself. Mm -hmm. So to think that a year from the start time, yeah. we wouldn't have a start time for the, for the United States, not start time for everywhere yeah. in the world, mm -hmm. but um that we would still be in this situation yeah um yeah and when, when we first started we're, we're probably thinking oh it's gonna be like a month or two and we'll start shows back up yeah right <laughs> well florida did yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah florida did I'm sorry. I'm slow. <laughs> texas um 
We, uh, it, as in fate of booking, we do have things in the books for the spring, early spring 2021. Cool. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's, hope that ha- let's hope that happens. Yeah. And there's definitely like um, a conversation being had with those agents, uh, with those promoters, excuse me, and my agents about, okay, if, if it can't open fully, can we look at some, can we, can we talk about maybe opening and advertising it at half capacity now um, and just watch it type of thing. But I think the idea is for us, anyhow, um, we were eager to have things on the books rather than not have it on the books Mm -hmm. because we assumed if we're still dealing with this a year out from the start, period, then we have more things to worry about than rescheduling another tour. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot more things to worry about. Yeah. Um, so I know, I know we're at your, your time limit. To me, ask you just a quick uh, two rapid fire questions, and then we'll ask yeah. you the final question. Ask everyone. Sure. But tell me about the first concert experience that you've been to. So it was, you should say first concert or your first memorable concert experience. Oh, well, my first concert and memorable. So my So my parents are are immigrants from Greece and um, they're, they're, they're very, they're very like uh, strict. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I wasn't allowed to maybe do a lot of things that other kids were early on. But my first notable concert, which it was a big deal because I can go to a concert was new kids on the block, which my dad stayed in the parking lot the whole time. (laughs) And um, it was, it was when they were, they were just like, like, I think there was like 500 people there because it was Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Mm. Um, and then my second most memorable concert, which is, and still probably um, accurate in terms of things I listened to, was uh, Lollapalooza mm. because Pearl Jam was playing. Like I oh, wanted nice. to go, and, my, and um, Jesus and Mary Chain. I wanted to go because of those two artists. And um, my, we, we basically uh, got like as far up as we could. And then like um, we walked the rest of the way and I think we caught a ride with like maybe a stranger. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, definitely things that I would kill my children if they ever thought about doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't listen and, to this. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was awesome because it was, it was Love Loser. And it was like Ministry of Destruction and, you know, Jesus Mary Chain and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which I'm not a huge, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, but they weren't the reason I was there. And um, later, as an industry person, I was talking to Don Muller, who works for Paul Jam still, mm-hmm. their agent. And he and I were speaking about that, about how that was one of my, my favorite experiences as a, as a kid going mm-hmm. to a show. And he was telling me, um, and I don't know who dropped off, but someone dropped off at Lollapalooza. And that's how Pearl Jam was positioned on there. But before that, they were drawing like, you know, like 50, 75 kids at clubs and how he wow. really just believed in this artist and developed. And I, I remember like hearing this and thinking, man, this guy's awesome. <laughs> like just hearing this story about how much he believed in this, this grungy band, you know what I mean? And yeah. And of course, like I got to see Pearl Jam again when I was pregnant with my daughter, actually, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, whenever, yeah, she's 10 now. So, um, and uh, Social Distortion was on that tour. So I'm friends with Social Distortion's manager and I went to see him and I went to see, um, because Pearl Jam was playing too. And Mm -hmm. I remember um, they came off the stage and, and like said hi and I was just like, (laughs) <laughs> like, oh my God, never geeky over a band. The only time I've ever gotten geeky over a band was them and when my artist toured with Foo Fighters, um, my artist May toured with Foo Fighters and Dave Grohl, we were in Houston and no one was backstage. I don't remember if there was a thing like, I don't, but I, for all those shows, I don't remember anyone being backstage. Mm. And I was watching May and Dave Grohl came and stood next to me to watch them and I was just like, don't look over. Don't look. don't act weird. <laughs> you're you you're acting weird in your head. Don't mm. look weird. So, and I remember he said hi, and I was just like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, those are like my two. And because I loved, like I grew up, that was my teen years, like Jesus Mary Jane and all of those like grungy bands, and mm. you know, like it, it, you know. So I was, it was kind of like, 
in my uh, in my geek mode. <laughs> <laughs> Those good ones. I saw Pearl Jam at Voodoo Fest in, in New Orleans. I love Pearl Jam. Yeah, they're so good. Really so good. good. And it's so funny because um, I just love their story. They They never stopped making music, you know? It just, and their fans are like, super culty so even when they were yeah. in their mainstream arena years um they were still producing music and they still had their strong cult following and mm-hmm. and totally. they put out their own they put out their own music that that you know i mean like they kind of just did things regardless of any kind of i don't know um i guess norm you know mm-hmm. and they just kept going and uh, very, very punk rock yeah, totally. Super fun yeah. rock. Yep. I love it. Me too. What is something that you'd like to see change uh, in our industry? Oh, hmm. that's a multi-layered question. <laughs> um, so much for easy, fun questions, right? Yeah. Um, I would love to see people give more people a chance um, and people to understand, or not understand, that's not the right word, but maybe to give people, give the, give the benefit that just because they don't know someone or they've never worked with them before, that that person is definitely worthy of their time. Mm-hmm. And it's a busy industry and we do tend to talk to people more when they have something we need and um, listen less when we think that they don't have something we need. And I've been through multiple different layers of work in the music industry where I've had clients that are super hot and people are coming out of the woodworks and then I'm working for clients that aren't super hot and to them, to me they are, to them. And Mm -hmm. so people aren't coming out. And I just think it'd be really great if, um, and and this goes for myself as well, you know, when people reach out that we are all listening, you know, not just and listening and not ignoring, just giving some people a chance. And, um, and that's, not, that's a mantra I apply to myself as well. Like I, I try to listen to every single thing that comes in. Um, and I don't give advice unless it's asked. Right. <laughs> I'm definitely one of those people. I'm like, I'm not going to, I don't want to berate someone or hmm. I'm not a musician either. Like I have right. no musical talent whatsoever. I have no sound engineering talent. I can cook. <laughs> like that's my artistic that's, that's talent. Important talent yeah i can feed people <laughs> you know but i can't but i know that like um music is a is a form of art it it, it takes a lot um of someone's soul to create it and i think that when people talk down to someone about their music it's 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 not making them stronger <laughs> It's yeah. hurting them. And I don't want to be an industry person. And I know that sounds probably weak and probably like so not music industry of me. But at 20, after 23 years, I don't, really, I don't really care how it sounds. I just feel like I want to be able to give um, someone a chance to be heard. And if, if they need more work, then I just tell them, you know, like, good job. Keep working at it. Like, yeah. you know, like, and um, yeah, it's, that's, that's just pretty much... I would love to see that change. And I would love to see, you know, uh, yeah. a lot more women, a lot more people of color. Yes. You know? Yes. <laughs> Get that, we just nail that. <laughs> <laughs> those are some great changes. I can definitely concur to those. And especially like giving more people, you know, even like a minute of your time when you when you can. Of course, like sometimes it's, it's busier, but even yeah. just like a quick response, like, Hey, I'm working on a ton of projects right now. Um, please hit me back in two weeks. And totally. Like, give, give it a minute then. Because at yeah. least you've acknowledged them versus ignoring their, their email. Yeah. I mean, um, I just find that um, there are people that are out there that are waiting to be heard and, and one response could just change um, that. It just changed your day even. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Leaves them inspired and makes them better at what they do and helps hopefully yeah. create that art that makes a difference for them. Yeah, yeah. I love it. 100%. So before I ask you the last question, uh, is there a good way for people to learn more about what you do? Like this is kind of where you can plug uh, whatever you want to plug. Um, oh. You can learn more about Beta or Nito or 
Do you want to well, Nito, Nito's website is super informative and that is where all the information comes and they on the board are always active and, um, and we have great uh, Zooms being informed uh, every few weeks and have, we, we know how far we're, get, we're coming along with this through those calls. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for support and you are an independent industry individual, I suggest signing up for it. Go and read about it on the site. I won't do justice on how much information's on the website, really. So go look on the site. Um, the support is there. Um, and there's a lot of people um, struggling. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're, all, uh, we're all there to help through that and that that membership and that site is there to help everyone so um that's neato theta you can find out our roster and all that stuff on the website um some people like to reach out to me from the website there some people have found me on instagram and started reaching out to me there that's always a weird one but uh, <laughs> You know, some people start liking pictures of my kids and then send me a press <laughs> private message. <laughs> I suggest the website. Yeah. Um, that way you can look at the roster. Our roster is super diverse, which I love because that's so my personality. I like just diverse things in life in general. Um, so you can go listen to some stuff you might not have heard there and you can find out all information on us there as well. Awesome. And I'll share both of those in the, in the show notes as well. Thank you. And then before I ask the last question, just thank you for, for taking the time to be on the podcast and for sharing. Uh, this time flew by. I probably feel like we needed two hours, but um, you know, we'll do around two one day. Okay. <laughs> and dive, dive a little That's, stuff. You're having fun, right? That's what they say. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, thanks for what you do and for giving independent artists an opportunity to um, one work with someone with the amount of experience that you have and then for just the, what you put out there as well through Nito and through teaching and everything. Thanks for being an, an awesome person in our industry. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And then the question I ask everyone at the end is what's your definition of making it? Oh, huh. um, I think making it is really relevant to the individual. Um, I don't think it, I don't ever try to um, define someone's view of success. Um, I think that making it is moving people with your art. I think as an industry person, we all have different definitions of making it, including myself. As much as I would love to work for an arena band one day, I don't think I haven't made it because I haven't yet. You know, I mean, um, but I think that my definition of making it is just moving people and and continuing to have your art grow through that having fans grow your art moving people and uh and definitely changing the people that are listening to you and you know making them enjoy all of the things that you're doing <laughs>